You can log your own. Not yet. Good. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to get the back. Yeah. Um.
Of all the songs from the dawn of creation, some were meant to desist. Of all the pilgrims from a thousand steeples, none came true. It's all got shooting, singing, glory, glory. Cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single several announcements so let's uh put our listening ears on just for a minute uh very quickly as you have in the bulletin the easter egg hunt is coming up this saturday and we need more stuffed eggs i see that hand let me finish the announcement and i'll let you speak to it uh so we need eggs stuffed you can buy them and stuff them or you can buy them stuffed and we have a little bin out here we've always been real good about this and helping with that and have a bunch of eggs and I think we still need some so the do that if you've got children grandchildren nieces nephews yourself who wants to come play or be a part of it we do need help if you're between two years and fifth grade then you get to be a part of it if you're older you get to work ah! all right so please indulge that yes brother Larry it is 12 o'clock, thank you, it is not on here. It starts at noon. We've invited the Happy Feet people that are out here until noon on Saturday mornings to join us and they finish right at noon. So we're gonna go from 12 o'clock to 1.32. Okay, two o'clock. So thank you, Larry, 12 to two. Appreciate that insight. Uh, the other one on the camp, we've got a bit of a tire work in this. So you gotta get your stuff in because when it doesn't come in, you're not going. So we tend to wait till it's like time to go out the door and sign people up. It's not gonna be able to be like that. So if you've got someone, I don't know if we hit the deadline. So we're getting close 15th, to the 15th. And so get the registration out of uh, off Jesse's desk, uh, not her desk, but the upper part. Ask somebody for it here at the staff and we will give it to you. It's $150. If you need some scholarship for your person, let us know. Uh, camp is awesome. My children have been going to camp since they were in the womb, and uh, now they're working it. This is Seth's last time to go, and then he's going to start working too. So uh, please be a part. It does do good things. Obviously, as you look at my children, I'm not biased at all. The youth are having a yard sale, and that will be uh, on May 21st from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you've got some good sellable stuff, please bring it. If it's real heavy or bulky, like furniture, a car, we need to come get it, we can do that. And so just let 
uh, Matt or Avery know, somebody of the staff will get it to them. But those fine young men, we are, we got a bunch of stuff we're gonna donate. I uh, hope Donnie doesn't donate me, but um, other than that, I think we'll be all right. If I'm for sale, y'all don't buy me or somebody nice buy me. I don't cook, but uh, um, anyway. All right, uh, also some people have been asking for the, the financials about the church just to give you a better detail on it. So these are now out on the table. How? Which way yes, am I pointing? Uh, right there in the lobby. Up right there. there. Looks like this. So it's like a basic overview for the first quarter. If you want to peruse that, you may. While you're perusing, I see that hand. Uh, anyone who ordered off the bus, I was coming to. Pick it up. We will be uh, at the back door of the kitchen. kitchen. Yes. All right, thank you, on my list. So if you are one that ordered one of the Boston butts that we've not been able to pronounce the entire time, uh, please come and pick it up today at the kitchen door of the Family Life Center, far side, that parking lot over there. And uh, you will, don't come if you don't, didn't buy one. I don't, <laughs> people were coming up while he was uh, cooking them and buying them off the grill. So, I mean, it was unreal. He, they've, been, they've been getting up at 5 in the morning and cooking all day. I mean, it's been a long weekend for uh, Larry and Craig and who else was? Uh, Al. Al and um, who else? Somebody. Chip. Chip was here and Greg, yeah. So, y'all got some good food coming up. We all do. So, that is good. Uh, also, uh, the, this Thursday is our last, uh, I broke my glasses, so I'm back to readers. Uh, is our last Thursday night of the Lenten prayer time on our Facebook page that Patrick has been leading very, very well. Yeah. And so please tune in. Uh, get up there right before 8. It comes on right on time, maybe a minute early sometimes. And enjoy it. This will be the last one for the Lenten service as Lent will be over also. Uh, so that will be Maundy Thursday. Okay, so uh, be, be a part of that at 8 o'clock. Put it in your phone for 8 o'clock to your alarm to go off at 745, and then you'll remember. That's what I do, or have been doing. Uh, that, and then uh, uh, Jackie wanted me to announce that we have a new website that uh, Patrick and has been working on, and who? Avery has been working on. Uh, so he's been working hard as he's been getting better uh, from his ordeal. And so go to that, newhope.churchspring.org, uh, and, and get engaged on the website and get that into your uh, likes on your, um, it's in your bulletin. Okay, so do that. Uh, also, on a <clears throat> other note, most of you know that our beloved, beloved Lillian Key has finally gone home to be with the Lord. Um, and so her service of celebration of life will be tomorrow. At 10 o'clock will be visitation, and then 11 o'clock is the service. Now, where is it? It's at Southern Heritage. It will not be at New Hope. There will be a meal afterwards for the family or for everybody? For the family here, but the service and the visitation is all up the road at Southern Heritage, 10 a.m., 11 a.m. And so let's uh, be in prayer for the key family. When Donnie and I came here, Miss Lillian's dad, Mr. Willis, was the elder statesman of the church. And he was a wonderful person, and we loved him dearly. Uh, he lived to be in his 90s, I think. So that being said, lots of announcements. If you need a repeat, catch me. I've had caffeine. I will repeat it. But let's stand together and focus our attention to the Lord. And we're going to do our call to worship together uh, out of Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14 together. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait and be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen. I was just trying to see if I was supposed to pray right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do love you this morning. We thank you for the celebration of Easter. Father, today as we go into Holy Week and we think of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, an animal of peace, as he is our Prince of Peace. Lord God, we thank you for the hope that was coming 
as he endured such horrible things in the coming week. And so this week, give us a special attention to what the sacrifices of our Lord and Savior, the Christ Jesus, your son, did for us in horrible suffering so that we might call you Abba, Papa, that we might have face-to-face -face relationship with you. Lord God, we are so grateful for the redemption from our wretched sins, for the hope of heaven. Lord God, we pray today that you would come and abide in our presence as two or more of us are gathered. You are here in our midst. Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people. So we focus on you now, putting aside all distractions and enter into your presence with holy hands and purified lips with the cleansing of your son. We pray for the key family. We pray for those that have lost loved ones, those that are ill and unable to attend right now for your healing hand. Lord God, bless this nation to be that light once again of Christ for not only America, but for the world. We pray for the Cumberland Church. We pray for New Hope specifically, that we will do all that you've called us to do. Be what you've called us to be. We love you so much, Father. We're so grateful for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who abides within us so that we can speak with you friend to friend, son, daughter, to Holy, Holy Father. We pray these glorious things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Remain standing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna.
Take this time to meet and greet one another.
Jimmy do it. It'd be quick. As we find our seats, it's great to see everybody fellowship and love to be together. Love that. We'll find our way back to the seats. Today I get to do both the announcements and the, uh, hello. Hello. All right. I'm sort of calling names in a minute now. Hello. Shep. Shep. <laughs> All right. We are at our time. Good, good. All right, we are now going to do our offering. And some of you may not know that to, to give your tithe, and specifically the tithe, is, a, is an act of worship. It is, a, is it an actual act of worship, just like singing songs. And we've had it eloquently said last week uh, before, you know, you want to do your tithe. It's separate from the offering. And, you know, what is the tithe? The tithe is 10%. The Word of God, we believe, as Cumberlands, uh, the inerrant and infallible Word of God. And the tithe is 10%, much like a day is 24 hours. And I actually know there's some argument about what a day is in Genesis that suddenly it changed for those verses and then changes back in other verses. But a day, a day is 24 hours in the Bible. And a tithe is 10% in the Bible. And that's what we want to start with. Donnie and I have lived our lives always doing 10% at least and then above. And the Lord has always provided for us in lean times as we go on with two people in college. But uh, people don't understand that this is the one part of God's word where he tells us to test him. Put me to the test and see if I will not open up the gates of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you such that you do not have room enough to receive. And so the Lord challenges us with the tithe to see what he will do in our lives as we tithe and give to him. And so I encourage you to always be faithful on your tithe for your sake. The church is blessed. We are blessed, and we will be blessed as we as a church, I believe uh, Jimmy said last time, we give and tithe from the church to receive the blessings here from that. But you guys have always been faithful. But I want you to know, as we stand here each week, the different people that come in, we say these things for your edification, for your blessing, so that you know that to tithe is to bring a blessing upon you, upon yourself, such that you do not have room enough to receive. And so I encourage you to start, if you don't already, to keep at it and build abo above it. Uh, we check ourselves each year at tax, you know, how much money came in and what our percentage is it goes out. And we have a certain level we do not ever want to go under. And it's above 10%. We want it to go higher as we can. And those are the kinds of things we want to do to the Lord, to give to him, to show him that he has our hearts. And he knows that if he has our wallets, he's got our hearts. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward.
Father God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for um, bringing us into this place again. Father God, be with uh, Donnie as he brings forth the message this morning. And uh, thank you for these tithes and offerings and bless them, Lord. Forgive our sins, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
better than you, Lord. Let's do the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Scripture, I got my mic on now. There we go. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go to the village ahead of you at once, and you'll find a donkey tied there and her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone, if anyone says anything to you, tell them the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. The Lord, I mean, then <laughs> this took place to fulfill what is spoken in the prophets. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed the cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed after shouted, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your transformation of our hearts. And that only happens, Father, when we receive your word. So I pray that we will receive your word today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May be seated. If you have not ever experienced the barbecue grill or the smoker grill group, you need to. <laughs> Once in your lifetime, that's all. I think it's, uh, I think, what'd you say, 12 year old? Yeah, to call them 12 year olds would defend the 12 year olds. That's true. To call them 12 year olds would defend the 12 year olds, I agree. Um, you probably find yourself, there's more jokes that can be made about the Boston butts. You know, we've called them smorks and all kind of stuff. Um, there's, there's more jokes that can happen. And we find ourselves as we sit around, and they were sitting around and talking and stuff. It's great fellowship. It's a great time to uh, joke. I, I was thinking this morning, because I told Jimmy, every time I mention, you can say something to Jimmy. It's like pulling a string, and it brings out a joke. <laughs> you know, I don't care. You can say the sky is blue, and it's like pulling a string. I reminds me of one time. I used to have a little doll that did that. You know, you pull a string and you, you, just, you get something different every time. So it's good. Uh, very rarely does he repeat his jokes. And when he gets a little older, it might get old. But right now he's got a bunch of fresh ones. So um, we find ourselves, and they do a great job. And if you're going to pick those up after the church over on the other side of the Family Life Center. Um, we find ourselves looking at life through whatever lens we look at. We hope for something and you hope for things to happen and, and how things work out. It's Palm Sunday this week. I think the Hollywood crowd got a different idea of Will Smith's Palm Sunday, um, but that was a whole different thing. He defined Palm Sunday in a whole different way. Um, you find yourself, for those who didn't get that, you'll ask somebody later. You ask yourself, and, and, and Hollywood doesn't get it. They don't get anything about what we do or what we have around in life. But you ask yourself, what are you in need of? This whole Palm Sunday we're looking at, and it's something that we all recognize and we all see and we all have a part of, and we've been a part of. We have the kids came through here with the palms waving them, and it, it was definitely a historical event that happened. But in those days, when you're looking at that crowd, and really still even today, what are people looking for, you know, and how they want to see something? You ask somebody in Hollywood what they're looking for, it's a whole different animal than somebody here in L.A. or lower Alabama. 
you find that those in, around in life, people are looking for something. They're looking for some kind of relief. They're looking for something in life. The crowd was no different in that day, what we read just right now. Each one in that crowd were looking for something. I titled this thing as that the prophet, the king, and the messiah. We'll talk about all three of those areas. You can do the prophet, the priest, the king, however you want to do it. Everybody was looking for Jesus to be something for them that day. No different than today. Most of us, when you talk about Jesus to somebody, and it is fascinating, all the things that you see right now of, I think it's going through the Alabama legislature, I'm not sure it passed or not, about the uh, parental rights, about educating on sex education. You can talk to a third grader or a kindergarten about who they want to be today and what sex they want to be, but you can't talk to them about Jesus. Isn't that fascinating how we've done that? Because the Jesus that we talk about is truly the powerful Jesus. He's a Jesus that is uncontrollable. He's not a Jesus that we can put as a genie in the bottle and rub three times to get our wishes, whatever they are. Jesus that we talk about is historical fact and historical figure of a person that walked on this earth, but it transformed all of history. It actually split time of how we see A.D. and B.C., what we find ourselves, as we see on Palm Sunday, it is that moment, and this week, next week, Christmas sermons are always hard, folks, because everybody knows the story. And we can check out. It's kind of like the tithers listen to somebody talk about tithing. They're kind of like, yeah, I got it. So I'll wait till next week and see what happens. This week is Palm Sunday. It is those expectations of that Sunday or that day when Jesus was coming in town, and he was bringing the whole message into town, but the problem is different people picked up pieces and parts of what they wanted. No different than us today. We pick up pieces and parts of what we need. You hear somebody talk about Jesus, how he met their needs, and if that's something we need, we may pick that up and add it to our religion somehow. But Jesus is not a pieces and parts kind of God. He's an all in all. Everything about Jesus, everything that we know about Jesus, everything we see in Scripture is not just pieces and parts. You cannot have Jesus that is the forgiving, merciful Jesus, and I call it the Metro Jesus with the little lamb in his hand that doesn't harm anybody. And see the same Jesus, here it is this week of Passover, you week of, of what we're looking at in the Lenten season where Jesus is going to go in and turn the tables over. That's the Jesus I like. Until he wants to come into my life and do that, then you want gentle Jesus. Go get Rick that way. Give me gentle Jesus. All we really want in life is, and this is the problem, and this is what, no different than Palm Sunday of biblical days. Jesus was coming into town, and everybody's looking at him, wanting their Jesus, whatever it was. We define it the same way in a lot of ways today. I want my Jesus how many times we heard that me and the big man upstairs, we got our own thing. All that saying is I'm making my religion up as I go. Stay out of my way. He ain't the big man upstairs. He's the heavenly father, the God of all heaven, the holy God. And I'll tell you, in our day and time in which we're living now, we got a Jesus that people look at and said, well, Jesus is forgiving of all sins, so let's exempt certain sins today. Mm, my little gentle Jesus. Bring that little lamb out so he can sit there and stroke that little lamb and tell you that you're not a sinner anymore. You don't have to worry about your sin. Listen, I'm telling you something, folks. The encompassing Jesus of that Palm Sunday is the same one that we're serving today. That's the same thing we're looking at today. I watch young people. I watch older people. You know, when we get older, we forget what sin is, don't we? We kind of do what we want to do, act how we want to act. I'm old enough. I can do whatever. I've heard that of old, older people. I'm old enough, I can do whatever I want. I love my Jesus, Metro Jesus, he won't bother me. Listen, I'm telling you, the Jesus that was coming to town on Palm Sunday is the same Jesus we have today. The Jesus that's coming to town, people are looking at him, they're going, and I need a Jesus that can meet my needs. There were different needs of that day. There are people who needed this prophetic Jesus that was coming to town. Prophetic Jesus, meaning he's been one that when John the Baptist came, he says, there's one coming that I can't even untie his sandals. There's one coming 
that y'all want to hear about. And he preached, what was his message? A message of repentance. I'm telling you, in our politically correct society today, this is not the Jesus we want. In our adapting of theological Sundays, where you can have whatever lifestyle you want, this isn't the Jesus you want. You don't want the Jesus that preaches that you got to repent. You want the Jesus because we stop in our message a lot of times. And when this Jesus is coming to town, you don't want prophetic Jesus. Because when prophetic Jesus comes to town, he's looking at the lady that's been laid at his feet that's full of adultery. And the men around her that participated with her, mm -hmm, how would they know? With their rocks in their hands saying, the law says... And please do not put little lamb holding Jesus right there. Don't do it. Do not do that. Today, I'm telling you, our alternate lifestyles are saying, it's okay. It's not sin. Well, we got this little sheep carrying Jesus that's looking at him going, it's not sin anymore. Listen to me, folks. I'm going to tell you something. He looked at the lady in adultery, but he also looked at the men in adultery. And he sat down, and they said he just wrote in the sand, wrote in the dirt. Probably laid out a couple of their sins each. Bob, tax evasion. Sam, I'm just using names. You know this woman. The only reason you know she's an adulterer is because you've been with her. They all kind of laid the rocks down. Now, if y'all want to put that little lamb Jesus up there, that's fine. How many times did he have to slip away after he got through speaking the prophetic truth when they were wanting to stone him to death? <laughs> he didn't mince words. Now, the reason I say all that is we're still wanting this Jesus to come today that will come and just accept us just as we are, which he does, but not to stay that way. You hear me on that, folks? Because there is, Jesus loves and accepts. He has mercy for those who hear his message of repentance. You cannot receive mercy unless you ask for it. Hear me? So the prophetic Jesus is going to come to town. And when he's come, he's looking around. And he's going, and I'm telling you, if Jesus were to walk in here. Oh, hey, Jesus. Hey, everybody look. If Jesus were to walk in this room right now. How many of us would cover something in our heart? Let that one sink in for a minute. Hosanna! Hosanna! I need prophetic Jesus, do you? When prophetic Jesus comes to town, he doesn't mince words. He looks at those guys that had those stones going to kill that lady. He says, all of you that's got no sin, cast the first stone. But then he didn't stop there. Hear me. He looked at the lady and said, don't, don't, don't do this anymore. Change. Walk away. He doesn't do it to hurt our feelings. Because we preach, and I hate to say it, my liberal brothers and sisters, they preach a Jesus that never asks for anybody to repent. He just loves you. If I had a Jesus that loved me, that never asked me to repent. He's going to leave me my sins that says sin begets more sin, which begets more sin, which eventually will kill me. If I had got a Jesus that loves me, he will require me to repent. So the prophetic Jesus is coming on this day because he's already mingled in this crowd and they're looking at him. And I love this last question and it's a question we have to answer. It said, who is this person? Who is this you answer that question. Who is this Jesus? Is it a Jesus that you're trying to get to come in and accommodate to your life instead of seeing a change in your life? Palm Sunday means nothing if we're just going to stay the same. When prophetic Jesus comes to town and when he's speaking to us, he looks at us and he looks straight past all of our facades we put up and charades that we play and he looks straight at us and he says, are you willing to change? Prophetic Jesus challenges us to be something that we're not at this moment. And listen to me, young people. Don't play games with this. 
You cannot have prophetic Jesus in your life and try to get him to accommodate your life because if you want him to accommodate your life, he'll say, I will see you when you invite me back again. He will not come in and just say, I'm going to live with all your junk. Older people, same thing. Hear me on that. Too much stuff we bring into our life and we want to bring Jesus into our life. And prophetic Jesus doesn't want to reside in our life without giving him the right to speak to every aspect of our life. Probably most of us, and we've all had it in our lives, and the most convicting little booklet was that. I still remember. I kept it in my old, bought an old Yamaha guitar. And the case is still in there. It's beat up. It's been to Guatemala. It's been everywhere. Been to camps. I kept this little booklet in there about Jesus living in the home of our life. <laughs> oh, God. I can still tear up when I think about it. And I read that, and I read that booklet. And the part that always got me was I was so busy because Jesus wanted every part of our life. And he kept asking for more. And that little booklet, that's Jesus in your home with your heart or something. I don't know what it was. but I remember I read that because... I say, oh, yeah, you got my, got my home. You got everything. You can have it all. Prophetic Jesus doesn't stop there. Because he goes, and it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever invited that person to your house, and they go to that, that door. You know what I mean? That nobody can go in as a guest. That door. We had one in our house called the little room. You don't go into the little room. <laughs> you just don't. I mean, if the problem was to go down the hall to the restroom, the little room was first. And so when the guest would come and you see him, where's the restroom? It's down the hall to the right, right there. No, don't touch the little room door, catch them. Because when you go in there, it's disarray everywhere. You invite prophetic Jesus into your life, prophetic Jesus. You don't hold rooms back. Even the one, the little room is in disarray. Because the problem is when you invite Jesus in, <laughs> he's going to look to the little room. He's going to find a little room. Whatever. Y'all, y'all don't have one of those rooms in your house? Okay. I'm gonna, no, none of us do. He goes to that door handle and we're going, no, somebody stop him. He's going to see our lives in disarray. Don't let him go into the little room. Prophetic Jesus. Oh, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus coming the highest as long as it ain't prophetic Jesus. Because prophetic Jesus goes past our facades and he goes to the little room and you look at it and you're going, that's where all the clothes are dumped before they're folded. That's where we iron. That's where we had all the stuff that really you just didn't want to deal with. Just throw it in the little room. If you're going to greet Jesus on Palm Sunday, understand it's prophetic Jesus. And that little booklet, it always put it there, and it said, <laughs> it said, you invite Jesus in your house. Say, come on in. My living room's right here. But as an invited guest, you're invited him into your home. Nothing's off limits. He goes to the little room, that place where you don't want him to go. That area of your life where you know you need to change, but you're going, just leave it alone. What was so convicting about that book? In that book, it said that Jesus went to the porch and sat out on the porch. And you look at him and say, what are you doing here? He said, until I'm invited into every aspect of your home. And have access to help you in every aspect of your home. I'll sit here. Gary S. Paxson wrote a song. He was there all the time waiting in line. When we finally get to the end of ourselves and we're, and we're next, it's like old Baskins Robbins. I don't know if y'all remember Baskins Robbins. You had to pull a ticket to see who was served next. That was up in Vestavia. Next, 34, serving 34. We get Jesus in this little place and say, and finally we get to the place where we're tired and sick and tired and sick and tired and say, okay, you can have access to everything, little room and all. 
I'm embarrassed to have you there. You shouldn't be there. This is my junk room. This is the place nobody belongs. I just don't want to deal with it. Prophetic Jesus, when we say Hosanna, he goes for little room. The other part of that book real quick is said he's sitting in the den by the fireplace, standing over there. He said each day you're kind of coming and going and coming and going. And then one day you glance over and you see him standing in there in the den. He's been there a while. And you realize the whole reason you invited him in was for a relationship, but you haven't spoken in weeks. But he's there. Don't ask prophetic Jesus to come to your life if you want your life. If you want his life. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The faces of the crowd that day, there are those that were touched by prophetic Jesus. So yeah, they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna, because it didn't scare them. The Sadducees, Pharisees, they didn't want it because there's too much they knew. Sam and Bob and those that are standing around the adulterous woman, they're like, who is this guy? They couldn't say anything anymore. What is this all about? Prophetic Jesus? Palm Sunday is the invitation into Jerusalem of prophetic Jesus. And then there's King Jesus. Here's, here's what they wanted. Here's what they envisioned. Then I saw a beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together Make war against the rider on the horse. Let me back up. He said, I saw standing open there was me, a white horse whose rider was called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes his war. His eyes are like blazing fire on his head in many crowns. His name was written on him. He had a, has his name written on him that no one but himself knows. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in the blood, in the name of the word of the Lord. The armies of the Lord will follow. This is the Jesus they wanted in Jerusalem. The Jesus that said that the rest of them were killed by the sword, rider on the horse, and all by the rider on the horse, and the birds gorged on their bodies. Man, that's the Jesus Palm Sunday was, that was Jesus. Yeah, we are sick and tired of Roman rule. I'll be honest with you, folks. I yell at the TV more today than I ever have. I'm sick and tired of politicians' lies and deception. I'm tired of the news media that tells me one thing and they do the same thing that tell me I'm accused of. I'm sick and tired of all the lies and corruption. I'm tired of it. Can you imagine what they were like? In the Roman rule days of Israel, we're supposed to be free. We're supposed to be a free nation. God gave us this land. And here is Rome that is ruling this with a hard fist. Our boys have to take up their knapsacks and carry them for a mile every time. That's by law. Or they can throw them in jail and kill them. All boys of any legal age have to do that. You can knock on any door you want to. Say, you're carrying my bag for the next mile. They have to do it. By the Roman law, you have no choice. Folks, we're going to probably get more sick and tired of what we're sick and tired of now because more is coming. We're living in 1984, what we read about and thought it was crazy, the devil speak and everything. But for you to speak truth in this day and time, for us as Christians to stand up and say a lifestyle is sinful, nowadays it's going to get even worse for preachers and everything else. I was watching, even as the Canadian pastor up there who was basically abused when he stood up to the Canadian ministry of politician and stuff up there, I watched the pastors up there who would stand for truth, and you find yourself going, God, you got to come. Come and be our king. <laughs> yeah, Chinese Christians cried out for that in the 40s when the communist rule came. The 40s also, when you had Hitler rise into power, they cried, I want this Jesus. Give me King Jesus. I need, I need King. Listen, folks, I read to you at Revelation, King Jesus is coming. Palm Sunday wasn't that. He came riding. They wanted Revelation 19, Jesus. They got Zechariah 9. It says he's coming in on a donkey, which was a symbol of peace. But then Jesus, in his dichotomy ways, he says, I'm not coming to bring peace. I'm coming to bring a sword. What is that all about? 
I want Jesus that's going to come in and he's going to speak to everybody as king and he's going to set it up and say, this is the way it's going to be, whether you like it or not. This, like it this way or the highway. Whichever way you want, that's your choice. That's the Jesus I want. I want him to come in and dissect my problems and tell me I'm all right and kick everybody else that's wrong out. The Jewish people wanted their country and independence. They wanted another King David. Yeah, he can rule again like that. They want this millennium reign that we see in Revelation. They envisioned Zechariah 9 coming. And when they saw that coming down the road, Zechariah 9, instead of Revelation, they had to be disappointed in some ways, but at some time, we all get a little disappointed. There are times that I see kingships about who has say, right? If you're king for the day, you got say. You're king of your kingdom. Whatever you say goes. Part of the problems we run into is that King Jesus, he is ruling now for those who recognize him as King Jesus. He is ruling already. Has he fixed Pelosi? No. No. I hope she gets over COVID. Has he fixed Donald Trump? No. If you like Donald Trump, that's fine. He ain't a perfect man, and he's not going to be a great king. Politicians aren't here to fix anything. Only those who are submitted to Jesus can really make a difference, really submitted to Jesus. And that's hard to even distinguish these days. What I found is that in Palm Sunday, they had prophetic Jesus coming in. Then he had those crowd that are saying, we want King Jesus. We want one that's going to fix every ill of our life. The problem is when I read in John 16, and this is Jesus about before he starts praying for his disciples, he said, in this life, you're going to have trouble. Ha! Isn't that bad? King Jesus is supposed to come. I'm not supposed to have any more trouble. King Jesus is supposed to be here, and he's supposed to fix all my ills. How many times have you sat by that person that life has totally fallen apart? And you tell them Jesus is a solution for all the troubles. We need a King Jesus, and he is King Jesus. We've tried to fix everything in our life. We've tried to rule our life. We try to find somebody that can help us rule our life. And then finally we get to the point of saying next, and here's King Jesus. And the problem is we don't always recognize him because he comes in and he's on the donkey. And that's the problem. Because when I want King Jesus to come in, I want him to fix it. That person that has offended me, that person that has wronged me, strike him down, Jesus. Now. And here he comes in on a donkey. I want the white horse, Jesus. Not the donkey, Jesus. Well, let me give you a little comfort here. Donkey Jesus at this moment can fix a lot of ills in our life because what happens is a lot of the ills are from within. The Jesus riding in on donkey is the one that's the prince of peace. He's the one Isaiah 9, and we sing about the magnificent. He's it. He's that all in all. He is that root from Jesse. He is that point of life that we all look at. And yes, he will one day be the order of kingship in Revelation 19. And I'm telling you this, folks. I don't ride horses, and I hope I get used to it before then. Because we get there before, and we get to come back with him. So we're going to be on the host of horses. Man, I, I see the big old Ponderosa maybe one day in our life. I don't know. But I look at King Jesus and I'm going, I want to be with my King Jesus. Here's the problem is, let's get used to King Jesus now. He may not fit what we look at because I, I do. I want, I want prophetic Jesus who entrusts me with the calling fire from heaven. I want King Jesus who wants to strike everything down at this moment in life and not give mercy even though I'm in great need of mercy. Because when the Jesus riding in a donkey, he's the same one that told people, it says, somebody slaps you on this side, you turn this side. I don't know if 
Chris Rock would have stood that night if the other side had gone too. <laughs> but he did. He turned the other cheek that night. That's why he won. He won. So when King Jesus shows up on Palm Sunday, you got the Pharisees, Sadducees over there going, well, maybe he can help us too. We just want Rome out of here. We want to be in charge. You got the people in the political realm going, how in the world this guy riding on a donkey is going to fix anything? And I'll tell you this, the same question we get today. How in the world can this mythical Jesus that you preach change anything today? There are people who believe that. It's just a myth. That same Jesus that rode in a donkey died, rose again. The prophetic Jesus, the King Jesus, everybody wanted something. And it was the Messiah Jesus that was coming to town. The Messiah Jesus, the one comes in and fixes the things that we don't even know needs to be fixed. The Messiah Jesus is the one that comes to town and he's coming in and he's going after the real problems. The real problems was not Roman oppression. The real problem was sin in our lives. The real problem is, yes, there will always be oppression somewhere. How can we fix that? By giving away socks and shoes. That doesn't fix anything. What it does, it just helps proclaim a message, yes. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not the liberal's viewpoint. If we can just fix societal ills, then everybody will see Jesus. The conservative is, if we can just get more people walking the aisle and just have them pray this prayer, and then they'll be fixed. So it doesn't fix everything. What it fixes everything is a Jesus that's the Messiah Jesus that comes in, who is invited in to live and reside in every aspect of our lives, first to us. I can point a lot of fingers to a lot of people who don't have a lot of things together. It's easy. You can see your neighbor's fault way before you see yours. You can see people around you's fault quicker, quicker. Because if you've got one good attribute, you can find five and somebody else is bad. Because in comparison, you're good. The Messiah Jesus comes in and puts everything level. And he says all can come. And he says even the children can come, which was rare during those days. Even the children. Messiah Jesus is the one who stood up in Luke, the fourth chapter, and he proclaimed what he was going to do, but nobody really paid any attention, which is not very different than us today. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Messiah Jesus comes in not just to fix the ills of society being a king, not just to be a prophet to point out the truth, but he's come to be an embodiment of all and to meet us at what we need. The embodiment of everything that we need, first and foremost, Messiah Jesus deals with our sins. Folks, you realize we don't really have a political problem. We don't have a religious problem. We don't have, we've got a sin problem. And the problem is we're trying to redefine even what sin is these days. And the church is falling captive to that. How do you redefine sin? Well, no longer is it a problem. Yeah, I can name whatever sin you want of this day, and you'll find some group somewhere that says that's not a problem because if we make that a problem, we may, they might not ever come back to church. We got to adapt the church so that people will come. But the problem is they won't come. They really won't. Not until they meet Messiah Jesus. Messiah Jesus will always deal with the sin. He'll always come to this place and say, the Spirit of the Lord has come. He's anointed me. Preach good news to the poor. Who are the poor? Those that are captive to sin, not just the poor physically. He's not just coming in and saying it's going to be health, wealth, and prosperity. He didn't come to do that. He rode in on a donkey in a peaceful way to say, I have come, but I'm bringing a sword in this thing because I'm bringing the word of truth. The word of truth always divides. He came to preach good news to the poor. He sent him freedom to the captives. Sin will always bring separation, put us in a place of captivity. The greatest thing we can do is to find ourselves in a place of preaching what Jesus preached as Messiah. He got to preach him as the Messiah, the embodiment of everything, the prophet, the one that can bring truth, the king, the one who can bring order, the priest who can bring us to the place 
to where we know God, the Messiah. People, even on Palm Sunday, even though the, everybody was excited, he probably had all the people in, in the group, you know, the ones that had been healed, raised. They've been touched by him. Then you had those participating that didn't really know what was going on. They just like a parade. You know what I mean? Isn't that the church today, folks? But what Jesus wanted to do is first and foremost, he wanted a relationship to be restored with our Heavenly Father. Yes, he came as king. Yes, he came as a prophet. Yes, he operated as a priest. But he was the Messiah, the Savior for the whole world. This Palm Sunday, all I can ask you, not just to welcome him into a part of your life, giving him a piece of your life. But if we're going to sing Hosanna and we want Messiah, guess what? He wants little room. He wants the lordship and the kingship of our lives be given to him. Does that mean you have any say in it anymore? You know what your say should be? Whatever, Lord. I'm good. Whatever you want, I'm good. Why? Because I look at it, and the only way we can be saved from our sins is an escape from ourselves. And the escape that's offered to us is that donkey coming in and that Messiah sitting upon that donkey. And he says he has come to bring in a whole new order to things. If your life is in disorder, if sin is ruling and reigning, don't redefine sin. Repent of it. If you're looking in your life, you're going, God, I am living a day-by-day existence. And really, I find at the end of the day, you're not welcome in my life. You're going to have to be really honest. That day when people were yelling Hosanna and Palm Sunday, come meet my need, Jesus. Be careful before you pray that because he will find what your true need is and he will go directly to that. Not what you want to give him, not what you want to define. If your need is, please fix so-and-so. You know what he's going to do? You become so-and-so. If your need, and you're saying, God, if you would just take hold of Washington and fix all of that, then my ills will be over. Now, sometimes he'll say, you know what? Just turn the TV off and let's talk a little bit. I'm not here to fix Washington. He's here to be the Messiah, to work through us. To find sin and deliver us. Let me ask you this question. Take an inventory. What is it that you love? What is it that you hate? And where is Jesus in all that? Just take an inventory. What is it you love? And sometimes I have to be honest, I love me more than I do anything else. What is it you hate? I can find what I hate out there more than that that's on here. How's Jesus fixing all that? Even John the Baptist had his disciples going and asking him. But I ask you the question, just like that crowd did that day on Palm Sunday. Who is this? Who is it? How would you answer it? Is he your king? Are you letting him work prophetically in your life? Is he your priest making intercession for you each day? Is he your Messiah? Because you need him. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you in Palm Sunday. There is that question still who you are. Even to us sitting here.
Lord, there are folks that are watching by Facebook. I pray, Father God, that you answer the question for them. We're not looking for a Jesus that adapts to our life. We're looking for a Jesus who saves us from our life, who is the Messiah. We're not looking for a Jesus that pieces and parts things out. We're looking for our Savior who comes and transforms us inside out. So come, Lord Jesus. Renew our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. Now I pray we recognize you when you come. May we sing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Thank you, Lord God, for being our Savior, our Messiah. If I sing this closing song and these... If you need prayer this morning, if there's anything that you need in your life, this altar area is not, it won't make you anything different other than walking down. What makes you different is the humility of heart and the invitation to Jesus. Why is the altar area important in a church? It's a place of humility. It's your choice of invitation. If you need prayer this morning, you don't know Jesus the greatest thing you can do is to know Jesus as Messiah and he comes as that prophet that king that priest in your life he'll save you from what you need saving from upon invitation thank you for your mercy Lord if you need prayer this morning I invite you to come Hosanna Hosanna visiting with us thank you for visiting with us today i believe this is what i'm asking you guys to pray may the i just sense he really wants to open up salvations in the in the in the church again in america but it's going to take prayer people coming to the saving knowledge of jesus christ my heart breaks because i see uh, we had a young man yesterday 15 year old we left this earth as the sheriff's call is out on that we see so many young people that are in need of salvation first priority does a great job but we see so many people in need of that let's pray that god open the altars again of our churches preaching the gospel to salvation that we can see that happening again we're not seeing it in america and it breaks my heart he is the true messiah the only savior of this world Pray for that to happen again, folks, that God opens up, for whatever reason, the heavens, opens them up so the altar areas of churches can be flooded again with salvation, seeing that happen. We need it. Bless you as you go. Don't forget to go pick up. If you bought one of the Boston Buds, go pick that up. Thank you for being here and being a part of this church. Next week is Easter. 
But we celebrate the resurrected one. We do it every Sunday. So come next week. But come every Sunday. God bless you. Have an awesome day today.